Right. And uh, for those of us who were fortunate to be here last night, we were introduced to our speaker, Dr. Abby Ann Lynch, who is currently the director of the bioethics department of the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Uh, Dr. Lynch has a distinguished background in uh, research, ethics research, in uh, lecturing, in teaching, in publications. And uh, those of us who heard her last night know how clear and uh, uh, challenging she is in her addresses. And so we are very happy to uh, have her again this morning. And this morning she is going to address the same general theme, which is the tyranny of autonomy, decision, health care decision-making for others. And this morning she will focus on the area of mental handicaps and marginalization. So, Dr. Lynch. Good morning. Thank you for your introduction, Sister, and thank you for your welcome. As Sister remarked, I'm here to talk on three occasions, and particularly in the general area of autonomy, which can be defined in many ways. We'd be talking, for example, about the ability to determine one's own particular choices and direction. We're talking about the way in which we respect each other because of a certain dignity we have, whether that's in terms of a religious orientation or a secular orientation, that we respect individuals who are, so to speak, freestanding and pose their own questions and their own answers. Last evening I was speaking about choices for children in this regard. I was speaking about young people who are fragile, who are to be protected and to be nurtured, I was speaking about human beings who have not yet reached maturity or the exercise of their own self-determination and posing for the people who are here some of the problems which arise, particularly in healthcare decision-making for very young children. In this presentation, I want to speak particularly about the social decisions we make for those who are cognitively impaired from birth. I'm not speaking about those people who were once able to decide for themselves, but rather about those people who have never had the ability to choose and who never will. In this connection, much of what was said yesterday about healthcare decision making for very young children applies. But the focus of concern here is the older human being who, by reason of limited intellectual functioning, poses a variety of unique ethical questions. Among those questions I'd like to address are the part these individuals play in medical education, first of all. Secondly, some comment about the arrangements to be made for living, that is to say, for residential living for these people. The limitations society seems to be willing to set in the matter of sexual reproduction for these people. And finally, the methods which are used in training, in educating, in protecting these people in terms of harm to themselves and to others. My overall concern today, as it was yesterday and will be later this afternoon, is that these people are easily marginalized by way of the exercise of the tyranny of autonomy. That is, by the choices made by those who have greater intellectual ability to the detriment of those who have less. Some examples will help to set a context for this discussion. So, number one. In a recent Ontario court case, several members of a medical faculty were found guilty of using the residence of a long-term facility for mentally handicapped people for the purposes of learning how to do rectal examinations and other physical procedures. 
These procedures were not performed for the good of the patients or the residents, but rather for the purpose of educating the medical students. In other words, these procedures were not done in terms of caring for these people as one would do in a normal physical examination when the patient presents with some kind of difficulty. They were done rather to teach the students how to do them on other people. Now, of course, in every teaching hospital across this country and around the world, medical and nursing students are always learning. They're always being taught how to do healthcare procedures. They must learn on patients so that they can be proficient practitioners whom we wish to care for us and for our children in the future. If they don't have opportunity to put the theory they learn into practice, then basically they can't be safe practitioners. And in the hospital setting, they learn to do this under supervision taking on gradually more responsibility until they become practitioners, licensed, recognized members of nursing, social work, medical professions. In the case in question, however, the young mentally impaired residents were not able to object to the performance of the procedures, nor even to consider their participation in them. Further, there was no permission sought from the resident's parents or their guardians, and there were no consents for these educational exercises by the medical students. In the case, the judge found that the medical faculty members who had assigned or allowed their students to perform in this way guilty. The fine was very small, one dollar. It was a token but it was also a symbol that mentally retarded persons are to be respected and that involving them in procedures that are not for their own purposes without consent is illegal. It appears that the residents of the facilities were not harmed during the medical student's learning process. The ethical concern was that these cognitively impaired residents had been wronged. There is a difference between harm and wrong. Sometimes they're the same. In this case, it was different, and these residents had been morally wronged. The case raises for us considerations concerning the moral status of those who are mentally handicapped. Certainly, were the individuals who were to be used for educational purposes not mentally handicapped, one would expect that questions of consent would have been raised. Just think for yourself. <laughs> if a student came to you while you were in hospital and proceeded to examine you in a way that had nothing to do with your sickness, surely you would have asked a question. Surely you might have said no, or you might have asked, do you have my consent? The lesson here seems to be that both mentally handicapped people and those who are not should be treated similarly, if not identically, in the matter of being used for purposes which are not their own. And so, while these residents might not have been able to give consent for themselves, surely someone else should have been asked. Surely permission should have been sought. Turn now to a quite different situation. The question of non-institutional residences for these people. Here, the case is made that mentally retarded individuals who can do so should come into the community to live in conditions as similar as possible to those of their non-cognitively impaired peers. In Ontario, for example, and elsewhere throughout Canada, the Association for the Mentally Retarded has now changed its name to the Association of Community Living. And that particular name is the message. What we see, of course, is the stress within that group to press for ordinary living for these people. This particular phenomenon of moving out is part of the wider move towards normalization for those who are physically or mentally impaired. 
It is a movement which has enormous impact on the educational system across this country and on the social service agencies in various local communities, this one and the one from which I come. Normalization is identifiable as well in the attempts made to deinstitutionalize those who have been mentally ill and to treat in the community as we can those whose mental illness does not require care in a closed setting. For the parents and the relatives of all cognitively impaired people, community living for their children or relatives may be a mixed blessing, however. So, for some individuals, for example, living in an institution, this has been their only home. They have never had another place to live. Moving out for them, particularly under the impetus of government reinstitutionalization or normalization or, in some sense, changing abode, may not be as easy as it appears. It may be very traumatic. Speaking of mentally retarded people now, these individuals should share in community living as well as they can. Certainly, they ought not to be warehoused and then forgotten, not to say abused or neglected. Still, for those who can live at home and not the others who may perhaps need a more closed setting, some communities lack appropriate resources to give the added support needed to assist cognitively impaired people to live happily and without worry outside of the larger government-supported institutions. And thus, we have parents and relatives who are the advocates for these people and who are struggling to care for their retarded relative as well as they can. They are convinced that community living ought to be an option, but they find that this is a kind of freedom for retarded persons, some, which poses some very real problems for those who wish to assist them. The shift from non-home to home, while theoretically desirable, in other words, may be practically very difficult. It's not coincidental, of course, that some of the outward movement toward the community is politically inspired, with a question of funding as its basis. Thus, for example, in the United States, it's widely suggested that the thrust of the move to community for these people was part of a wider strategy. That is, to move federal funding out of the picture and to rely much more heavily on state funding. In Canada, we find that there is a movement not only to decrease federal funding for social services to the provinces, You've all been reading about the battle over transfer payments, but also to decrease provincial funding to the localities and in the localities to rely more and more on local funding and on volunteer services. It seems then that the move is a general one. And still in the community, there is a gap in funding which is left to be filled by family and by volunteer groups. And in some communities, this gap is to be filled by families only because the communities are very small and with very limited resources. And these families may be overwhelmed by that particular responsibility. The overall question remains then, what place ought mentally retarded people to have in our everyday lives? What part ought we to have in their living? How do we see these people who are not able to make all of their own decisions about living? And what's our obligation on their behalf? The question of normalization towards community participation for mentally retarded people thus presents itself as a paradox. On the one hand, as the judge said in the first case, we seem to be saying that these people are like us and indeed that in many ways they should be among us, with us. At the same time, we're saying that they are different and that our collective funding will not quite extend 
to give them the support they evidently need. In general terms, we might call it something like the gap in moral thinking. Do as I say, but not as I do. A different, a third kind of case, is made when we consider a certain, again, Ontario agency policy according to which aversive techniques, hurtful techniques, were used to achieve behavior modification in groups of mentally retarded individuals who lived within an Ontario institution. In my province, many of us, if not all of us, were dismayed to learn that electric cattle prods were being used to correct, to direct, and to control the activity of some mentally retarded people. Our sense of dismay was based on several considerations. The certainty that these techniques, electrical shock, caused pain, and that some of these procedures could be identified as very similar to methods used by those who torture others in other parts of the world, an activity which is condemned by all of us. We believed that these techniques were often used not so much for the good of the cognitively impaired individual, though that might be true in particular cases, but rather for the good of the people with whom they lived. In other words, that these people were being treated in some way for a purpose which was not their own. We were particularly horrified to think that these cattle prods, originally designed for use with animals, could be applied, and it was alleged humanely applied, in the case of human beings. At the same time, those who cared most closely for these mentally retarded people expressed concern about the difficulty of trying to protect them in those cases in which they might harm themselves. For example, those persons who suffer from a particular syndrome where they very often spend long periods of time banging their heads against the wall. There were concerns that unless these people were somehow controlled, they might hurt others, which again could happen in an unthinking and unrecognized way. And particularly, there were public questions as to how there could be any proper and gentle control of people in these situations, given the low number of human resources available in many of the institutions in question. Quite apart from the difficulty of how retarded people or any people learn, that is to say, do we learn better by pain? Do we learn better by encouragement? Do we learn better by example? An interesting problem for another day. The question of the social priorities was raised, and with those social priorities, again, the question of the moral status of these individuals. What place do cognitively impaired people have among us? And how are we to treat them? And what does that imply about meeting their needs, not to say our own? One last and particularly difficult question here concerns the approach to be taken in assisting those with mental retardation when the matters of sexual relationships marriage and family planning are raised. Of particular difficulty is the latter question, and it's one which has been referred to my own department. Statistics show that more children with mental handicap are born to parents who do not have handicap themselves than are born to those who do have mental handicap. There are a number of reasons for that, among them physical development, and a slowness in that area. Statistically, then, the question is not so much one of genetic inheritance as it is one of concern for the well-being and nurture of children born to those parents who have cognitive impairment of a more serious kind. In individual cases and in general, we ask, will those children be well stimulated and educated? Will they be kept from harm? Can cognitively impaired parents cope with the stresses of child rearing? 
And then the question seems to turn to methods of contraception, sterilization, and perhaps non-marriage for these people, not to say some kind of segregation among those of opposite sex. In Canada, the Supreme Court has prohibited any physical intervention which is not done for the best interests of the mentally handicapped person. In the particular case, which is known as Eve, E-V-E, Eve, sexual sterilization in regard of mentally handicapped persons was declared to be illegal. And thus, in Canada, to practice surgical sterilization on a mentally retarded person is prohibited and presumably impossible. On the other hand, for many, the old United States decision in this area, and it was a Supreme Court decision as well, called Buck versus Bell, still echoes in the background. And that decision was, and I quote, three generations of imbeciles is enough. Thus, in the public interest, some say, something ought to be done. Clearly, we have a moral problem about the status of persons who may have mental handicap in the area of child raising. Now, when the question of the possibility of genetic disability, meaning the possibility of inherited mental uh, cognitive impairment, does arise in the counseling of mentally handicapped individuals who are planning to marry and to have a family, the issue is particularly poignant. In helping these people collectively to set some kind of guidelines for counseling among themselves, some distinction must be made between the individual who has the genetic handicap which affects cognitive ability and the individual herself. There's great difficulty in doing that, in separating discussion about mental retardation from the person who has mental retardation. Some of these particular individuals have said to me, if we choose not to have children, we are really saying something about the low esteem we have for ourselves. They find that their group is very seriously fractured on this point. How are we to help here? To ensure the companionship and support of family living while yet ensuring good care for children who are born in these particular circumstances. It seems to go well beyond the notion of preventing the possibility of the birth of children to engage us in a community exercise to make possible for those who live among us the kinds of advantages and pleasures we have, while also offering them a certain kind of protection. The social lives that we choose then, or that we direct, or that we dictate for mentally handicapped people present a very serious question for us and for them. We seem very quick to wish to limit reproductive possibilities for these individuals. We do this because we feel bound to protect them from harm, from that anxiety and stress I already mentioned. And at the same time, there's no doubt that we're attempting to protect others from harm, perhaps their children, but also, and a third very real presenting possibility, perhaps to protect ourselves from adding to what's been called the social burden which these individuals might bring to us. The ethical dilemmas involved in choosing for handicapped persons in this area then are indeed difficult and they have grave consequences for each of the persons in that group and for the group as a whole. And so it seems to me that there is need for us to develop a philosophy of mental handicap. And you won't be surprised to hear that from a philosophy teacher, nor from someone who's interested in a view of the world which includes mentally handicapped persons within it, not outside. In our own view of the world, how shall we think about those? How shall we think about who these people are? What principles shall we enunciate to be used as grounding our relationships with them? 
In the beginning of this series of lectures last evening, I made reference to one philosophical point of view, one which seems to be ever more prevalent. I'd like to speak about it now in a little further detail. Among those who hold that particular philosophical view, the first question asked seems to be this. Who ought to be considered persons? The response given, only those who have certain capacities. That is, A, the ability to be conscious over time, an ability to have an awareness of one's past, future, and present. To be a person, in other words, you have to have memory, the ability to know where you are, and to think about the future. B, the ability to appreciate reasons for or against acting, the ability to sometimes inhibit impulses when one judges it would be better not to act at that time. So one needs a second qualification to be a person in this view. And third, C, the ability to engage in purposive sequences of actions. So one has to be able to plan and to carry out three characteristics. According to this viewpoint, if any of these three characteristics is missing, the individual in question is not a person. For those of you who have followed this literature, of course, there have been a number of people writing in the area. We did see an early article by Joseph Fletcher, which was called The Indicators of Humanhood, and it was succeeded by another article which talked about the 20 characteristics of humanhood. And we've moved from that with this one to be speaking about what it is to be person. This particular scale could be used to classify those who are in a permanently vegetative state as non-persons. For example, individuals like Karen Quinlan and Nancy Cruzon. That is those for whom there is no evidence to say that they will ever return to what the judge called a cognitive sapient life. Those who appear to be beyond pleasure and pain. So the permanently vegetative state people would be declared to be non-persons. No sense of time, no ability to reason, no way of carrying out purposive activity. The scale could also be used to classify as non-persons individuals who are somewhat conscious, not like Nancy Cruzan or Karen Ann Quinlan, but individuals who are profoundly and permanently demented that demented sounds strange to lay ears, but basically it's a technical term which means moving away from, that's the de, the ability to use mental power, so dementing. Now, those persons, mistake, because I'm speaking another language, those people have no memory, presumably. They're not able to do purposive action. They're not going to be able to appreciate reasons for and against. They are non-persons. Without too much imagination, it would be quite simple to classify a certain mentally retarded individuals who are not profoundly dementing as non-persons, according to this scale. And we've already done this in a small way, not by such names, when we begin to say that the normal IQ is this, that those with an educable IQ have that, that these people have an ability to learn, that those people do not. The question, if we were to apply the scale that way, would become one of setting out a difference of degree of reasoning ability or a particular level of awareness. And what could well become quite arbitrary might then become the standard so that many would be persons and many would be non-persons. And if we pressed it just a little harder, we could do it in this room, and we could do it in the family, and we could do it in any group with which we work, some who can reason less well and some who can reason better. Those who speak in these terms are quick to note that this last suggestion shouldn't even be considered. There is, they say, the line, clear line, between person and non-person, and in fact, it won't apply to those who can reason even slightly. 
They're also quick to note that, quote, lack of personhood does not imply lack of moral status altogether. That's a quote. They say rather that the ability to experience pain and pleasure gives a certain status and may thus impose limitations on how we are to act towards non-persons. And the argument concludes that these non-persons will be quite safe because it's widely held to be wrong to cause gratuitous pain to animals that are uncontroversially not persons. So there are to be some limits here. A question in response might be, how then does this kind of reasoning work out in the current business and necessity of allocation of scarce social resources? And the response is very quick. Quote, if a conflict occurred between an obligation to give pleasure to a non-person or to continue a non-person's unbalanced pleasurable existence and the important obligations towards persons, we could forego the former in order to fulfill the latter without injustice. That's a quote. More simply phrased, this means that persons are to be judged el eligible for the use of such resources prior to considering the eligibility of non-persons. The argument continues, and I quote, uh, double quote, other non-persons, such as many animals, are not commonly believed to have claims on social resources to continue their pleasurable lives, though it remains wrong to cause them gratuitous suffering." End of the quote. And to conclude, the withholding of the right of self-determination from those with certain mental disabilities does not affect the moral weight of those rights we do ascribe to such beings. So that's the end of the quotes in the argument. Now, if we were to attempt a critique of this position, and it seems to me important to do so, if only to try to understand the argument, we might begin by voicing some of the apparent contradictions and inconsistencies within it. For example, how correct is it to speak of some human beings as more similar to animals? Are mentally impaired individuals more closely related to them or to human beings? We might query what will attempt, what will prevent the attempt to grade certain individuals, a practice which we have seen fictionally, at least, in the case of one of Huxley's novels. You recall in Brave New World, the creation of the alphas and the betas. Again, we might ask why it's important to delineate the difference between non-persons and persons. The question of criteria here is not unlike that which was asked a little while ago about the delineation of criteria to be used in pronouncing human death. Who is dead and who's alive was the question. Now, why did we want to know that? Why did we want criteria to say these people are dead and these are not? In the case of declaring death of human beings, the criteria were identified so that appropriate grieving could begin or so that certain medical care inappropriate to those who were not living could cease, or so that transplantable organs could be taken, or so that burial could take place. It's evident that declaration of death doesn't occur just so you can have a declaration. Rather, the declaration is for a purpose beyond itself. Further, it's important to note that the criteria were agreed upon. They were determined by individuals by us, or by the medical community, or by the law. There is no discovery for the criteria of death because we don't know what death is. And the criteria were just there to give us markers. So we determined what the criteria for death might be in terms of what we thought death was. And even now, there are some who argue that the criteria for death should be redetermined so that those who have limited cognitive ability or socialization capability should be declared dead while still able to breathe. That's what the discussion about whole brain death and partial brain death is all about. Those who have whole brain death presumably have no electrical activity in the brain and are not able to function physically. 
Those who might be declared dead because of upper brain death function are those who would have lost their mental ability but still be able to breathe. Death to those people, then, implies non-thinking or low-level thinking or lack of communicative ability so that when those signs are present, we'd be talking about technically neocortical lack of function or neocortical death. And indeed, unless we wanted to wait for decomposition of the body, the declaration, which could be declared on the basis of these criteria, are also a means for setting out the way in which we're going to use certain healthcare resources. So to come back from that aside, to return to the case of deciding who is a person and who is a non-person, and note that only persons can do this, non-persons have no part in it, only persons do do this, why do we set out these criteria? Is it a totally disinterested process? Or is it because there's something to be gained here for us? For example, access to more resources for persons, not access for more resources for non-persons. Is it that in declaring the difference between persons and non-persons, we can feel less responsibility for those who are now not like us? Less guilt in terms of what our obligations to these individuals might be. And how is it that we choose to identify persons as those who are thinkers only? What about use of other identifying characteristics? What has happened here is a distinction made among human beings. Some are persons and some are not. But we could use other kinds of criteria. Those who haven't got money are not persons. Or those who are short are not persons. Or those who have a particular race are not persons. Or those who practice a particular religion are not persons. In the memory of some of us, that has happened. And we do it now, although less openly, perhaps in terms of culture. The fact is that the word person has a particular status in our vocabulary. And to be declared a non-person, to become a number, to become a cipher, is somehow a way of manipulating individuals to make them have less status and less meaning. My suggestion here is that to enter onto this business of delineating between persons and non-persons is to embark on an ethically perilous course. There is great probability that each of us will become a non-person at some point. At some point we will become cognitively impaired. So our own self-interest should make us very wary of this classification scheme. Further, it seems inevitable that degrees within the category of person will emerge. More of a person, less of a person than a non-person. There will be the alphas and the betas. The dividing line between person and non-person here is very thin. And indeed, it is easily crossed. If we look in the clinical setting for just a minute, one could be a non-person in what appears to be a persistent vegetative state, only somehow to become conscious again and come back to the world of persons. We are persons before the motor vehicle accident, which somehow causes brain damage, but in that particular second, we're no longer persons again. It appears that we may be the victims of our own cleverness, our own cleverness in this matter. So why do we have this particular scheme? But beyond all, our intuitions tell us that there's something quite unrealistic being proposed. Surely we think there must be some other more acceptable approach in identifying individuals who have less cognitive ability than we may have, but who are no less human than we. As it happens, a quite different way of thinking about the moral status of mentally handicapped individuals has already been suggested to us. It is the way of life adopted by Jean Vanier. This may not be the way of life to which we aspire. The L'Arche community, residential style, community living with those who are mentally retarded and those who are not, 
seems meant for only a few. But this way of thinking and living does suggest an alternative method for conceptualizing the place of cognitively impaired people within the human community. Dr. Vanier is proposing as a philosophy of mental retardation a radical oneness between those individuals and ourselves, a radical equality among all human beings. It is a oneness which is built on love or charity. It is a mutuality based on respect for others as sharing a common spirituality in terms of origin and destiny. There are differences to be recognized among us, it is true. Yet we profit from these differences. For those who are cognitively impaired, we learn to assist and to share in their suffering. And from those who are cognitively impaired, we learn the meaning of love, of trust, and of openness. In Dr. Vanier's case, this oneness is rooted in a religious conviction. For many others who share a similar point of view, if not Dr. Vanier's chosen lifestyle, this is rooted in recognition of shared humanness. The concept of radical equality is not divisive. It's not a matter of we and them, of persons and non-persons. In philosophical terms, the commonness identified here is not based upon consequential reasoning. What problem needs to be solved? And thus, what definitions do we need to draw up? It rests on a prior view of the ordering in the world around us. It's a philosophy of mental retardation we could do well to consider. Now, somewhere between Dr. Vanier's approach and the one mentioned earlier, there has to be some middle ground. We have begun with deinstitutionalization and with laws which speak against discrimination on the grounds of mental deficiency. We have certain policies of advocacy. We have certain educational plans in place to help mentally retarded persons. These are a beginning. The task for us here and for all in a society around us is to think together so as to come to some understanding not only about the decisions which must be made in terms of these individuals who are not capable of self-determination. More importantly, we must consider the appropriate grounding for the decisions we will make. Is best interest for the mentally handicapped individual the appropriate standard? And if so, what will it mean in practice? Perhaps the better standard is to minimize harm, or, as some have proposed, the least restrictive alternative. The very real question will come, however, if it's not already with us. What portion of our health care or educational resources or social services is to be turned to the use of the various groups already identified? Surely at that time, it will be better to speak from the perspective of unity rather than from the perspective of arbitrary difference of status. In terms of our own faith tradition, we share the beginning and are the end of our lives with these people. We are like them as a matter of justice, not charity only. Indeed, we are very like them in terms of our own particular limitations, for we are all handicapped in some way. So, once again, as we reflect on the reality of mentally handicapped people in our midst, we recognize that the burden of autonomy is a heavy one. That burden could lead us to marginalize those who are mentally retarded. It could point to the need, perhaps later on, to our own marginalization by others. What we need to do now is to decide for ourselves, to decide about the responsibility of deciding for others. This will call for interior change and for external action. At the neighborhood level, in our church, in our social group, and at the level of local politics, it's not the kind of task to leave to anyone else. If retarded people are among us, and are us, and are voiceless in these matters, 
then each of us must speak for two people, but with one voice. This seems the human, that is, the social thing to do. Indeed, lest the autonomy, the self-determination we desire and cherish for ourselves become a weapon of tyranny turned against others and ultimately turned against us, we must once again learn its use and its proper limits. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lynch. Now, we're aware that some students may have to leave to, to go to another class, but Dr. Lynch has agreed to answer any questions. Um, so we would ask you, if you have some, if you could use the mic in the middle so that you would be heard, um, unless you think... Um, when someone who has uh, unbecoming behavior, I don't know, like someone who may have uh, destructive self-addiction, it's like banging one's head against the wall repeatedly. Now, how do you help that person to correct it? We can't say by hugging and friendship as you have in uh, large communities. But suppose that that person carries on banging one's head against the wall, against a window, uh, on a regular basis. Now, what about directional behavior, corrective behavior? Uh, I think the, the question is a good one, and it's certainly posed in many of the institutions in Ontario. I can't speak for in any other place. The question seems to be, how are we going to prevent people from harming themselves, which is a very real problem. And if, in fact, the persons were competent and rational and wanted to destroy themselves or to do this in their own way for some particular reason of their own, it would be difficult, but we would either leave them alone or perhaps say that they should be examined in terms of psychiatric illness. For those who don't know what it is that they're doing and who seem to be hurting themselves because banging your head against the wall will hurt yourself, the question has to be how do you protect harm, protect from harm? And there are a number of ways to do it. One of them, which is well used in many of these institutions, is to have these people wear almost what are football helmets. It may look funny, but it does protect them from harm. Another has been the use of harm so as to combat harm. In other words, to cause pain and to stop causing the pain when the person stops doing what the person is doing. But for many of these people, they're unable to stop doing what they've been doing and pain isn't going to change it. And so it does seem that we'll use in that particular practical way what's called the least restrictive alternative so that these people will have this kind of a helmet to protect themselves. That may not be uh, what others would see as aesthetic, but at least in terms of helping them to stay, in a certain sense, physically intact, it does for them what you can't do. For these people, you wouldn't be able to help them simply by holding them or simply by comfort, not all of them. Some of them you might be able to do in that way. So the re least restrictive alternative, I guess, is what we're talking about. Now, some would argue that that takes a lot more time or a lot more staff, but basically we have to figure out what it is that we're trying to achieve here, which is mainly to make these people comfortable, protect them, and keep them within a community setting if we can. A very restrictive alternative might be to tie them down or something like this, which seems to be not at all acceptable. So practical decisions come with considering the various alternatives and choosing the one that fits in the possibility as we can. I don't know if I fully formulated this as a question or just wanted... <laughs> Sorry, that's I don't, all right. This competition I for you. I don't know whether I fully formulated this as a question or I'm just kind of reacting um, to some of the things you said in my own thought processes. But when you talked about sort of the importance of coming to definitions of humanness, um, 
inclusive definitions of humanness and the issues of allocation of medical and educational resources. At, at one level, it seems to me, that takes it out of the issue, out of the context of morality and ethics and brings it into the arena of public debate and, and, and social priorities nationally. And in terms then of how one achieves as inclusive an educational and social and health policy as possible, you're not just talking about our own philosophical commitments to a broad scope of, of to all humanity, but also of how one influences society so that these are socially defined as as, as appropriate and priorities rather than um, other uses to which we could put um, national resources. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess the sort of question that occurs to me after thinking it, about it in that way is, is what your thinking is on how one influences those sort of national debates on, on use of our, our resources um, because <laughs> I'm not sure how one can, and, and I say that with some, some tradition as, a, as an activist. Thank you. I think, you know, your point is certainly very well taken. It's easy to be an armchair ethicist, you know, and say this is the grand theory and this is how it has to be. I think as teachers, uh, many of us, as uh, persons who are parents, we have some obligation at least to begin by discussing the principles on which any kind of social action is going to have to be based. So what I was talking about were the very general principles, because if we don't have that, if we don't have a roadmap, we have no place to turn or we don't know which way to go as we start into this. Now the practical question then is how do we make that happen? How can we do it? I suppose a simple answer would be to say that the uh, power of one is a magnificent kind of power, that if we don't do something about wrong, uh, basically we're almost guilty of letting the wrong go on. But more than that, we can think of communities where it has been possible. For example, uh, one person last evening spoke about the community effort in maintaining an individual at home who was dying, possible only because the community came together united under a central idea that this family needed support and that this person needed assistance and company in dying. So the community spirit was reflecting what the individuals agreed was the basic principle. And I think we can see communities where we have a certain notion of what ought to happen, Marsh being an example. But aside from that, as a rather extraordinary kind of example, how can we do it in practical terms? I'd say that we could do it um, in terms of our church groups, for many of us seem to belong to those, in terms of introducing the topic and making it practical. What have we done when a group home application has been made in our neighborhood, for example? What have we done when in my neighborhood, three doors down from the church, it was the people in the church who said, no way. We don't want mentally retarded people on our street. Uh, what can we do in terms of some of the continuing education programs which talk about advocacy? Uh, when we have in Ontario, for example, a proposition of several new laws which will have direct effect on those who can't decide for themselves, who has gone to a committee to make a statement? What groups have we put together to make some kind of a written brief? Or even for those groups to which we belong, when we start talking, for example, about the curriculum at the PTA, what have we done to talk about introducing the subject of fairness and justice to those who are, if you like, less privileged than we? Some of us have an opportunity to do that on a national level. We either have spouses who are involved in larger political parties or who are involved in national groups. But the place I have an impression that we have to begin is right here. We have to begin with our families and our students. We have to begin in the place where we are to somehow change it and to make it happen. And we can't do it unless we have some kind of principles to go with. The principles aren't going to tell us exactly the political strategy. So in ethics, there are two different things. One, one says to you, here's how you think about the problem. This may be right for this problem. But the strategy says, how do I make it work? <laughs> Now, in, in terms of my own work, which is much more in the hospital, here's the strategy, for, or here's the opinion that this is the right answer to the question, but there are certain people in the hospital hierarchy which I, whom I wouldn't approach for the question. That's a strategy thing. There are certain people I would. <laughs> there are certain people to whom I'd address letters. There are times to propose that and times not.
So I think we have to marry the principle and a little bit of strategizing to make the kind of thing happen that we want to. I know that that's still a very theoretical answer to your question, but I think we could start with the group homes in our communities. We could start with talking about the tax rates in our communities and the allocation of resources at ratepayers' meetings and so on, trying to make a little bit of a difference. Yes? Um, now, why would you say that a person who is severely handicapped mentally is not a person? Uh, I wouldn't, Father, with all respect. I, I was describing a philosophical viewpoint and setting up a contrary one of Jean Vanier. But why would you do that? My suggestion has been that one reason that we do it is that uh, in the long run, there's something to be gained by defining certain people in and certain people out. The fewer people who are in the boat, the greater chance the boat is going to get to shore. If we put a whole lot of people in that boat, it's going to sink. So we might decide to limit who gets in the boat, who's a person and who's not because of our own particular interests. But isn't that awful dangerous for those people to say such a thing? If those people who are severely handicapped or in a coma um, are not persons, mm -hmm. then they're animals. Well, in their uh, judgment, it's, they can do away with them. It's possible, Father. That's what I was suggesting. I'm not saying that uh, one has an obligation to preserve and to do every single thing possible for a Nancy Cruzen or a Karen Ann Quinlan. But if we decide not to, I'd suggest to you that it's not on the basis of non-person. There are other ways of thinking. Because non-person is a very pejorative phrase. <laughs> People don't want to be non-persons. In the 1930s, if we recall very clearly, the first non-persons identified were the Jews. These were non-men, if you remember. And then the gypsies were non-men. And then the mentally ill were non-men. And then the mentally retarded. And we know from history what happened. That isn't to say it'll happen this time, but it is a way of causing division in, in what is a human community. I had two questions or two points. I, I wondered if you would make some commentary uh, on um, the Charter of, of Rights, the Canadian Charter of Rights, and uh, how how this your philosophy would be, how these two tie together. And the second one is, um, I think, um, a question of when we move towards this philosophy of more our common humanness and our common humanity and our oneness. Do you think that governments are going to be tempted to want to, you know, perhaps get on that and at the same time have, you know, we, we don't want to recognize the difference which has a price tag to it. So I'm always caught in this dilemma about yes, our common humanness and therefore yes, you're all welfare recipients and you're all going to get the same $459 a month. But, you know, in, you know, in actuality, the potential of some of these people to only earn a certain amount of money even though we're working on that, is not recognized. So it's a kind of, yes, isn't it wonderful? We're all human now. We're all, you know, welfare recipients. But I, I'm always caught between these two worlds of our sameness and our differences. Okay, I'll, I'll try on the first one. First, uh, having to do with the place of those who are mentally retarded under the charter. Uh, the person speaking is not a lawyer. So I don't hold myself out to give legal advice in case there's a lawyer here. I hope you'll help me out. Basically, under the Charter, as I understand it, and certainly in Ontario, under the Code of Human Rights, there is to be no discrimination in areas like housing uh, for those who are mentally retarded. In other words, based on that particular characteristic alone, the individual is not to suffer negative consequences. The individual may, if you want to call it, be discriminated against, be discriminated against in terms of an ability to do a particular job but it has to be very closely related to the job. It can't be discrimination for the sake of being different. So, so far as I understand it, the Charter indeed does protect those individuals who are mentally retarded, giving them the same rights that we all have. 
Now, the rights that we have, of course, don't guarantee that we'll all be millionaires or that we'll all get PhDs or that we'll all have the opportunity, for example, to have a vacation in the South. They give us the basic civil liberties of defense in the courts, for example. They give us the basic civil liberties of not being tried unjustly and and that sort of thing. So basically, we're considered to be equal there. Now, your question about the unity of human beings and how we can both be unified and different, and how it is that we figure out what we do about the difference without destroying the unity. Is that fair? And so there there are a number of ways that people have done that. Some have said, for example, that everybody should be absolutely equal. I think if we pursued that line of thinking for a little while, we'd see that it can't work, because there are people who are going to be different, either physically because they can't, for example, climb the curbs at the sidewalk, and that's different from those of us who can or there are people who are not going to be able to do certain things about money, which some of us can do. So we have to recognize that there's going to be difference, but we have to say that there's difference because we're united in the first place. It's not that we start differently and then try to find the unity. It comes the other way around. So then the question is, what do you do about the difference? And some have said that basically we should do much more for those who are different, trying to make up for their difference a kind of justice in reverse. It's the kind of thing we sometimes see uh, as we move in terms of the uh, equality of women. (laughs) We try to make up for bad things that happened in the past by appointing a few more to boards or making it a bit more possible for them to have jobs in the community. We see it, for instance, in ads in Toronto, applications from women and those of visible difference. <laughs> uh, those applications are more welcome. That's, that's one way to look at it. You make up for the past. Another way uh, might be to say, well, they are so different uh, that there's no way of equality. So basically what we're going to do is to try to prevent their existence. And that's a route that many other people have taken. My own sense is that we have to develop a notion of justice, which includes and whether it's going to be a proportional justice, they need a little more than we do, because basically they have an inability that we don't have, and if we're a community, we're ready to do that. And so you begin to see an attempt to subsidize living for these people, which the rest of us don't have, to help them in sheltered workshops, which the rest of us don't have, to have particular kinds of education, which the rest of us don't have. And the problem is just the one you identified. When we do that, it means that the rest of us have to pay more money for that. And so the fundamental question comes down, do we or don't we think that these people should be treated in that way? If we do, then it is going to cost us more money. The question then is, well, why should we do it? What do we get back? (laughs) It isn't what we get back. (laughs) It's the philosophical perspective which drives us to do it. And that, I think, is what we have to convince other people of. What we'll get back, if we're close enough to these individuals, and it's very hard to say because we're just talking about a group out there, but if we're close enough, those who are can tell us from their experience that there are personal rewards. I don't say that's why they do it, (laughs) because I don't think it is. But there is a reward in helping those persons who can't help themselves. We know not only that we should, but there comes back some kind of reward. But for most of us, we're not going to get that tangible personal sense. We're going to have to be driven by what we might call in philosophy an a priori reason for doing it. It's not going to be because it pays us. <laughs> it's going to be because we think it's right to do. So. Thank you once again, um, Dr. Lynch, for giving us not only a clear theoretical framework um, to help us think within um, uh, in assessing some of the issues that you addressed, but also in bringing it to the very practical, uh, personal challenging level to see that um, because we are all uh, part of society and of humanity, that we are all involved in these issues and that nothing is outside of the realm of the ethical uh, and moral consideration. So I thank you very much for your presentation and I would invite uh, those of you who are able to be here this afternoon to come uh, to the two o'clock lecture here in the same place uh, when Dr. Lynch will address the same general theme of healthcare decision-making for others.
and this time uh, focusing on elder ethics. So thank you, and thank you, Dr. Vincent.